really have this conversation, pull in your questions. Once again, use Q&A if you have anything that you would like to share with us. Second thing, it's about the theme for our conversation. As I said, we have been seeing digital technologies accelerate, and but also we're seeing manufacturing regaining importance around the globe, across geographies. So how are those things connected? What is this new era of manufacturing? What are the opportunities? How can companies and countries leverage new technologies in order to be part of this new manufacturing era? Finally, in terms of the logistics, we, as I said, we have initial remarks and then we will uh, join this group conversation. We are recording the session. It will be available afterwards at the GFCC YouTube channel. So please join us there and share the links for our upcoming conversations. And if you are on Twitter, we will be tweeting about this session using the GFCC hashtag that is at DGFCC. So please join the conversation in social media too. Having said that, let me briefly comment and introduce about each one of our speakers, starting with Deborah. Deborah comes with an amazing background that combines government and private sector and I think one of the most privileged um, people in the globe today to see the connections between technology and manufacturing and how they have evolved and continue to evolve in the globe. Deborah is the president and CEO of the Council on Competitiveness in the United States, and we are lucky to have her as the president of the GFCC. Joining us from Australia, we have Alex Subic, who is the vice president for RMIT University. Alex, and just as we're getting started, I really want to thank you for encouraging us to address this topic of digital manufacturing. The conversation that I had with you and Jeff Connolly at Zeman Australia was very inspiring in terms of understanding the challenges, but also what do we need to do to develop skills in the manufacturing space. It's wonderful to have you here, Alex. Pleasure, Roberto. Pleasure. From Colorado, we have Bryn Watson. Bryn is the Vice President for Lockheed uh, Martin Corporation, a GFCC member. We're very proud to have you and Lockheed Martin as a member of the GFCC, Bryn. Bryn has been leading, leading digital transformation at Lockheed Martin across geographies and business units. We are delighted to have you here, Bryn. Thank you. From Australia, but originally from Germany and having worked across the globe in Europe, in the United States, and now in Australia, we have Michael Franey. Michael is a senior executive at Siemens, driving everything digital. So thank you so much for joining, Michael. We will hear from you, I know, not just about technology, but how to develop capabilities across the industries, and that's uh, very important. From okay. Ireland, we have Paul Maiden, a director for the Center of Competitiveness, one of our GFCC members. Paul, we're very proud to have the Center as a member, to have you here with us. You have been working with mid-size SMEs, a very important topic. So we look forward from, uh, to hear from you. From Brazil, or based in Brazil, we have Paulo Pires. Paulo is a uh, Vi uh, Vice President for Embraer, the aircraft aerospace company. He oversees manufacturing with an incredible career in manufacturing operations, uh, driving digital manufacturing at, um, at Embraer across the globe. Paulo, great to be here. My colleague Chad Evans, who was here in a, a few minutes ago, was with me at Embraer in a series of GFCC university leaders a year ago. We learned a lot. We look forward uh, to hearing from you now. And finally, we have Pelayo uh, joining us from uh, Chile. Pelayo has an amazing career that includes uh, media in the past, civil society, and is one of the key leaders driving digitalization in Chile with the País Digital or Digital Country or the Chile Digital um, uh, Foundation. Uh, we are very happy and it's great to engage Chile in our organization in this conversation. So without further ado, 
I really want to turn to you, Deborah, for your initial remarks before we turn to our colleagues and, and guests uh, here. For all of you who are attending this conversation, once again, we are tweeting about that. Join us in social media. Share your questions here using the Q&A feature. This is a very important topic. We're happy to have you. Deborah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roberto. And let me thank you for your leadership of the GFCC and the stimulating conversations. And also formally welcome our very uh, distinguished group of speakers, panelists that hail from around the world with, with tremendous individual experience, but collectively, I think it's really a, a dream team for discussing the uh, acceleration of the digitization of manufacturing and how this is impacting every dimension of business, as well as how we live and prosperity. I thought I'd just start out by sharing something that, that takes me back a little bit in, in, in my career, but I believe the digitization of manufacturing, its transformation, its acceleration, is in some ways a back to the future story because it was some 40 years ago in the United States when there was a strong recognition that the nation's innovation capacity, its national security and its standard of living really was directly linked to prowess and production in advanced manufacturing. And as some of you may recall, there were fierce uh, manufacturing competitive races underway in certain sectors of the economy, autos in particular, machine tools, et cetera, and a lot of uh, leadership coming out of Japan in new manufacturing processes, uh, focusing on total quality management, et cetera. So I thought you know this would set a stage a little bit because back then there was a, a, a comment that was made that gee, no one will go into the manufacturing enterprise. Young people don't wanna be in manufacturing, everything software. And the rubric was, well, manufacturing's dirty, dumb, dangerous, and disappearing. And fast forward 40 years, and we've been saying this for a long time at the Council on Competitiveness, manufacturing is smart, it's safe, it's sustainable, and it's surging. And this has really happened now increasingly at warp speed in the aftermath and during the global pandemic. Um, we know that there was a slow but steady transformation underway driven by the array and connectivity of, of a myriad digital technologies, digital design tools, high pro performance computing, modeling and simulation at the edge, sensors and big data for production control and optimization, use of cyber physical systems, of course, such as robots and autonomous vehicles, and of course, managing digital networks for operations and supply chain coordination. Um, the pandemic turned this upside down. We saw massive disruption in global supply chains. We also saw the um, focus on efficiency and cost, perhaps uh, being too much at the forefront versus a, an, an emphasis on resiliency, performance, and security. And um, speaking from a US perspective right now, I will say that it was very shocking to the United States, the dependency of our nation on the outsourcing of critical production in pharmaceuticals and medical devices, and how dependent we were on supply chains that in a pandemic have really collapsed. But the good news, and we're gonna hear this from our panelists, is that the transformation into smart manufacturing and all that it entails with how people are, are being trained, how they learn and how they perform is accelerating in a positive way. And there's a broad recognition in nations around the world that manufacturing cannot be outsourced. Every nation has to have a capability in the 21st century manufacturing enterprise and that one of the new platforms for manufacturing, just to be in the game is sustainability as well in materials and life cycle. So let me stop there and just come back to manufacturing being smart, safe, sustainable and surging and, and look forward to hearing from our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. And uh, Alex, I really wanted to turn over to you and if you could maybe share a bit 
what is digital manufacturing? What's your view and what do you have been doing in Australia to develop the capabilities that are needed for, for, to, to make that happen in practice? And everybody, if we could just respect four minutes, let's be quick and then we'll have a fantastic conversation again. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roberto and Deborah, for a wonderful introduction and, and such a pleasure to be part of this leadership dialogue involving our colleagues from around the world. It's essential that we exchange our experiences, insights and best practice and, and share ideas because I think the next stage of development for all of us will come through that Carpa connectivity, through that engagement across the borders, helping each other to understand better the frontiers we, are, we have embarked on. Uh, well before the COVID uh, pandemic breakout, uh, we have embarked on the fourth industrial revolution and, and that has impacted every sector and perhaps the manufacturing sector uh, initially more than many other sectors because it's such, a, such an enormous influencing sector that, that, that involves a great number of jobs that has, as Deborah said, a profound impact on many other aspects of the society, of supply chains, on the skill sector and so on. Uh, and that, that uh, evolution of the fourth industrial uh, uh, transformation uh, across the sector has been accelerated, as you pointed out, Roberto, during COVID. We've seen, as Deborah mentioned, you know, how important it is to have sovereign capability in manufacturing, to be able to produce you know, equipment at scale and at pace using advanced manufacturing techniques that are, you know, where you can produce bespoke equipment products, high value add products at scale and pace, and at a cost that permits, you know, that development at that kind of a, at that kind of a level. And that is where you're taking away, taking away the labor cost as the competitive advantage and actually using creativity ideas and, 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 uh, and value add as, as the key driver. In Australia, we've, we've, uh, established a number of uh, uh, not only think tanks, but committees and, and working task forces to actually help accelerate this transformation. Starting from the realization that the manufacturing sector in Australia involves around 95% of SMEs. When you have a sector that comprises of around 95% of SMEs, you realize that you have to develop more innovative way of clustering and engaging with the sector you know, in select areas that are aligned with, with the national industry growth areas in order to help that transformation, in order to, you know, fast track that transformation for the benefit of the nation. We've commenced with the Prime Minister's Industry 4.0 Task Force more than six years ago, almost, almost six years ago. I was privileged to be a member on that task force, including our colleagues from Siemens and from SAP, Australian Industry Group, and so on. And that collective task force has established a number of important international relationships, including with German Industry for Zero Platform, US as well, and, and engaged in developing a roadmap, a strategy, and unfolding what Industry for Zero means, what digital manufacturing means for Australia. From that, we've, we've uh, stemmed a number of important national initiatives. One of those is the one that I lead, is around establishing the National Industry 4.0 test labs, one in each state, which is now as a platform providing a, a basis to scale that up and, and, and expand the network with new test labs because the whole point of that is to establish standard practice and, and scale of engagement with industry to support transformation. The Industry 4.0 test labs are aligned with different priority areas of Australian of Australian growth industry sector portfolio. Uh, as Deborah mentioned, you know, we were looking at areas of automation, cyber physical systems, advanced materials, but also sustainability and clean energy supporting manufacturing at scale, as well as the Australian resources industry, liquid natural gas, new frontier technologies, as well as other resources and so on. Agri -tech, agricultural technologies, bringing industry for zero in processing industry and so on. And that's coupled with a, a scaled up pilot program in education and training, where we are, we are rolling out a higher apprenticeship in Industry 4.0, diplomas and associate degrees, and establish a continuum of education and training across digital, you know, digital skills development, putting skills at the heart as an enabler 
of our Industry 4.0 transformation. So it's a multifaceted, multi-layered approach that uh, aims to create a much better interconnected ecosystem where you're developing a number of elements that are essential for success in this transformation. I think that this is culminating now with the national federal government releasing the new modern manufacturing strategy, which we were looking forward to and influencing its development because what that does is it states that Australia has been a manufacturing nation. Australia will stay a manufacturing nation and our future is in digital transformation of manufacturing to develop sovereign capability to create new jobs and to enable value creation across the value chain well, below, well beyond manufacturing, but stemming from manufacturing. I'll leave it at that. Alex, thank you so much. And I think that you, you touched upon a, a very critical topic that we had a chance to talk in the past, that is creating scalable models to develop the capabilities that are needed in society. So thanks for commenting on that. And Michael, I want to turn to you as an industry leader who is really at the forefront of those technologies and also their application. In a few minutes, we'll have a poll coming here for people in attendance, just to, for you all to share your in, your ideas on what are some of the key technologies. But Michael, I want to turn to you to hear from you. What are how can we use in practice those different technologies? What is key? What are you seeing around in Australia around the globe? Over to you, Michael. Thanks, Roberto, and um, thanks, Alex. And for, uh, first and foremost, thanks for having the opportunity to be on this panel. And let me start with uh, with a question: Is digitalization trend and fashion, or is it technology with a purpose? And um, it may sound a little bit strange, but you know, I'm, I don't drink alcohol. But my, one of my favorite stories is the story of a microbrewery in Melbourne, here in Australia. They invested into automation and digitalization technology just a couple of months ago. And as many of the companies around uh, the world, they were very hardly hit by COVID-19. Before COVID, 80% of their production was done in kegs that were delivered to restaurants and bars. Um, so overnight, that basically went away, dried out. Based on the technology they had, they quickly pivoted and shifted their manufacturing from keg production to can production. And now 80% of their production is in cans, which they on sell to distribution. Furthermore, the technology that they used in digitization and particular data enabled them and mostly their brewmasters to work from remote. They only had to come to site when really something happened. The whole brewing process uh, was monitored uh, from their homes, from their remote areas. In addition to that, it helped using the data to improve the brewing time from one batch from 23 days to 18 days, which is like a 30% productivity gain. And last but not least, they decided based on the data and information and the productivity they got to produce more flavors to keep customer interest. So all that combined made them actually really successful even in those times of pandemic. Uh, and they have been quite successful here in Australia with, with that go to market. So. When I'm asking, is digitalization, you know, we use this buzzword so often, a trend and a fashion, or is it really a technology with purpose? I give it a big tick because it enabled productivity, it enabled flexibility, and they maintain quality. So, really using data and automation uh, helped those companies in difficult times to switch. Who can participate? Alex started talking about um, education. And I want to give you another example. In my department, we have a department that helps customers in digitalization. It's called Digital Enterprise. We have two so-called Industry 4.0 apprentices, and I will elaborate on this a little bit later, and one um, university, university student. And those three actually helped us in developing an application, an app, that was working on the cloud to enable customers to quickly make use out of their data. We all know that many customers are uploading tons of data and information into the cloud, but it's very difficult for them to actually get something out of it. They, the three of them, a university graduate and two Industry 4.0 apprentices developed an app. This app is now used in more than 30 countries worldwide without a lot of marketing. Uh, we have international customers in the US, in Australia, 
you know, it was on a, on a global shared platform from Siemens, so they adapted it quickly. And it's even used in the Siemens factory uh, to display information. What I wanted to say is, it doesn't matter if you, where you sit, digitalization doesn't have geographical borders. Um, it takes, of course, a certain education. And I want to pick on a little bit or, or add to what Alex said. Um, it had started in 2014, actually, between Germany and Australia when the prime ministers met and said, well, we want to collaborate more on certain aspects. And they came up with 49 recommendations, this panel. And one of, as Alex said, was Industry 4.0. Uh, and there was an Industry 4.0 task force built, which signed an agreement between Germany and Australia to collaborate on five major streams, cybersecurity, and one was ed actually education. And in Germany, we have very good experience on education where students are working in university as well as have practical experience in industries. And it took a leap of faith, and um, Alex was instrumental in that, I have to say, when he was with Swinburne, between Swinburne, a couple of industries, and actually government, to start with a batch of 20 so-called Industry 4.0 apprentices. And those apprentices worked or were educated at university half of the time, and half of the time they spent time in industry. So all of us came to the table, put some money on, invested, and you see the outcome. Those guys have done a fantastic job, and they do the fantastic job uh, in other industries with other partners, and the program is going on. So once again, I think being successful, and as a nation being successful in Industry 4.0, you need to invest. You need to invest in education, but it has to be a combined investment between industry, government, and education sector. Thank you, Michael. And there's one aspect that it stood out to me is this, to me, there's a democratization of the possibility to make impact in manufacturing. This notion that someone who, um, let's say, joining you as an apprentice has developed a solution that was then scaled up globally with a speed right. that maybe that was not possible in the past. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. For our colleagues in attendance, we have a live poll here. If you could share your ideas and insights on the most impactful technologies that are coming to the manufacturing space. We'll be reviewing that in a minute. Bryn, I want to turn to you because your mandate, it's a bit broader than manufacturing itself. And it's about bringing digital solutions and digitalizing the whole way that a large engineering intensive corporation like Lockheed, Lockheed Martin works. How is that challenge? And how do you see the difference maybe across nations as you have R&D and manufacturing and service operations across different uh, nations? Brain, over to Colorado. Well, thank you. And it's, it's a thrill to be here. I'm honored to join this uh, illustrious panel. And, uh, and what a great conversation as well. Um, when I think back to the 24 years that I've been at Lockheed Martin and and um, I can say, you know, this has been the most unique of my career. And, and 2020 for Lockheed Martin has been both a big challenge, as it is for all of us, I think, um, but also um, very fruitful and very successful in ways I, on it, I didn't expect. Um, our, uh, our production floors uh, did not stop. We, we uh, are essential production workers, manufacturing workers continued to support their missions and, and ensured that we were delivering on all of the critical commitments we've made to our customers um, around the world. But I will say we're, we're operating very differently. Um, we're operating very differently uh, and, and in ways that I believe will take us uh, in, into the post-pandemic uh, manufacturing uh, and delivery uh, era. And, and when I think about what we're doing different um, it's about how to bring and accelerate technology to the factory floor uh, in ways that we hadn't imagined before the pandemic. It's, it has been fueled by uh, an improvement or an increase in collaboration, virtual collaboration that we haven't experienced before. Um, and then I'd say it just pushed us to think differently about how we execute our work. Um, so in going into that post-pandemic experience, and I'm thinking about the entire product life cycle, you mentioned that my, my, the focus of my digital transformation work is about the entire product life cycle. 
Um, but with the eye towards everything is about driving that efficient uh, manufacturing process, right? Um, so it is all connected. Um, but some of the areas that we have learned uh, is about flexibility. And so where can we bring technology and um, tools to the hands of our workforce um, to take advantage of um, automation? Uh, and and um, Deborah, I appreciated your comment about in traditionally we look at dull, dirty, dangerous activities for, for automation uh, solutions, but, but we're bringing those thinking that, that thinking to everything we do now. Uh, and so I'm seeing a lot more in automation and then how we're working better together across our uh, collaboration boundaries, our, our organizational boundaries in a way that I don't know if we would have embraced as, as easily uh, without having the pandemic experience. And I'll say how critical the supply chain has been to us um, in this last uh, year as well. Um, we have an extensive, as you can imagine, uh, set of partnerships uh, through um, up to 8,300 different um, suppliers around 39 different nations. And we have experienced some challenges uh, with the pandemic. And you know, what Lockheed Martin did very quickly was to take action and to accelerate our, um, our payments to make sure that we were helping these folks to become robust and viable through the challenges that they were experiencing. And I know that we'll continue to strengthen those partnerships um, going forward. But when I think about the levers that either a supplier or an emerging nation, an emerging manufacturing company can take advantage of now going into that post pandemic. Um, it really, in my mind, is around embracing the model-based enterprise. And so when you think of digitizing um, the work that we do, it has to start from the beginning of the concept of the product, right? And so you know, where we can enable and encourage and embrace the model-based enterprise thought um, into what we do uh, together um, as partners across our industries. I think that that will bring the ability for other nations to participate, right? And, and other emerging small companies to participate. Um, that seamless exchange of engineering and manufacturing information across that product life cycle to me is gonna be the key to international product development collaboration. So those who are successful and engaging their engineers across that life cycle through these new tools uh, will be successful you know, in this new future. Those that are willing to form partnerships around creating that industry-wide model-based enterprise. So what customers, what partners and universities are going to come together um, to establish standardization or, or, um, or just industry consortiums around the model-based enterprise I believe will be success, successful in this future state. And then moving from uh, 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 traditional training programs to reimagining how we train and, and recruit in this future state, I think is gonna be critical for those who will, and those who do that will be successful. So it is about um, how do we br bring a data literacy to all in our workforce. That is a new concept and that's something we are embracing, but we need everybody in this industry uh, consortium to embrace that same. And, and then how to have that digital dexterity across um, not just in your manufacturing workforce, but th you know, through all of the different disciplines that, that um, pr uh, contribute to the, the production uh, process. Um, so I think these are areas and levers that new countries, uh, emerging countries, emerging um, uh, companies and supply uh, partners um, uh, can can use to be successful in this future state. I think it's quite exciting, actually. It, this is very exciting, <laughs> and your comments are very exciting. I think uh, the two things that you mentioned here that really um, caught my attention. This thing that we need to think differently, and we need to engage early in terms mm -hmm. of from the beginning, from the outset, to have like digital models, digital platforms, digital thinking. So um, thanks, thanks for sharing that. But you also provided a great, a, a great cue for Paul um, uh, to join us from Ireland because you mentioned 8,300 suppliers around the globe. And I imagine companies with different sizes, but for sure, many of those are mid-size or, or, or could be small companies. So Paul, over to you, because this is something that you are really on the ground. 
how can this digital wave and especially digital manufacturing wave get into the mid-size SME domain? Paul, over to you. Hey, thank you, Roberto. Um, that actually is the very first issue that I did want to address in this short session. Um, we do work with uh, a broad range of small to medium-sized enterprise um, manufacturers that, that work in lots of different sectors. Um, and within the last year, or year and a half, we have worked with a cluster of these companies to um, perform what we call a digital readiness level assessment. We, we use a free to use online tool that, that, that was developed with public sector funds in the UK. And um, through the use of this questionnaire and a facilitated workshop with each of these companies, we've been able to focus on three broad areas, leadership, uh, technology and value, all from the point of view of digital technology and what, what sort of purpose or assistance such technologies can bring um, to, to these businesses. And the analysis of the results that we've um, uh, had access to so far, actually it's encouraging because some of the issues that are arising have already been referred to in, in previous panelists' comments. So things like um, how can digital technologies be used to change our business model? Um, how can we use digital um, transformation to underpin our working with our suppliers and our customers? So across the whole uh, value chain. From a technology perspective, the issues that have arisen are things like um, uh, additive manufacturing to make bit pieces or bit parts uh, in situ within small companies. And horizon scanning for technologies, what, what technologies are out there? And um, to take the point that I think Michael mentioned earlier, rather than just go for, for what's fashionable, look for something that is fit for purpose to support what the company needs, needs to do. The problem with small companies is they do not have frequently the resources to spend time looking out into the world to see what technologies are available, what other companies and organizations might be using these for and what they can learn uh, from that. So our organization has a role to effectively act as a, an intermediary to try to keep an eye on what's happening in, in the digital world and make sense of it and interpret that for the small companies that we work with. I think another, um, a uh, thing that small companies will need to consider seriously um, uh, as we look into the future is they need to be flexible uh, enough and prepared to consider diversifying their business. So rather than focusing on perhaps a very narrow line of products to a small group of customers, um, the experience we've had with some of these companies has been that the COVID pandemic has effectively completely trashed their business model. There's a company, for example, that works in the aerospace industry. And when the bottom fell out of the aviation um, industry at the start of the pandemic, um, that had a knock-on impact immediately into aerospace. And, and one particular company that is uh, one of the premier suppliers to tier one aerospace companies um, in the UK, uh, they, they specialize in manufacturing plastic components. And they sat back and they're quite an innovative company. And they thought, well, how can we pivot our manufacturing processes and assets to do something different to sustain us until the aerospace industry picks up again. And uh, effectively, they, they've designed and developed in very short time um, a polymer-based ma face mask that people can use as personal protective equipment. So this is they've gone from being an aerospace supplier to effectively a health sector um, supplier, and they've devised this thing called a bubble, B-U-B-L. If you Google it, you'll, you'll see what they do. So, and I, an awareness of the need to diversify the, the, the way the business operates and the products and services that it provides, I think will be important as well. And finally, I think um, uh, it was mentioned earlier about supply chain um, sustainability and supply chain resilience in particular. And, and we're starting to do some work around this in terms of helping companies that sit in the middle of a supply chain. So they're looking back down the supply chain to their own suppliers and further up the supply chain to their customers and um, to, to help them think about, well, you know, what does it mean to be a reliable supplier in today's world? And I think two things come into play there. One is robustness. And what do I mean by that? I mean, how many hits can the company take from external events before they collapse or fall down? And the other one is resilience. You know, how long does it take them to stand up again and, and, and get back on their feet and, and do something different? So looking at how to sustain supply chains in the future uh, will be important. 
In terms of levers that nations and regions and cities can use, I think principal among these will be funding, funding for appropriate innovation activities, initially raising the awareness of the importance of innovation um, within an SME environment. Um, and secondly, providing funding support for skills retraining. Um, it's already been mentioned earlier. And I think if the powers that be in government can be persuaded to do so, in terms of how they deploy their funding um, to incentivize or perhaps provide a premium level of funding for companies that are prepared to look at green technologies. And um, I mean, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic at the minute, which has posed an, an existential threat to humanity, if, if you think about the number of people that have died. But there's a much greater existential threat that we're faced with, and that's the climate emergency. And Different countries have said that by 2035 or 2050, they want to have reached a sort of a net zero carbon um, uh, sort of economy. Um, 2035, that seems like a long time away, but uh, we can't wait until 2034 before we suddenly wake up and, and do something about this. So government, I think, has a role to play here, particularly in terms of the, the building back piece of um, reviving the economy. Uh, investing in infrastructure like social housing uh, and schools and hospitals, but mandating that um, carbon friendly materials are used for, um, uh, for the manufacturing of these assets and the manufacturing companies that are involved in so called offsite manufacturing to supply um, these assets to the public sector will need to have uh, a strong command of digital technologies, will need to be able to operate across their supply chain seamlessly, as, as Bryn has mentioned, um, using uh, technology support. And I think that um, government also needs to issue some grand challenges. Uh, there was a very good example of that earlier this year in the UK, where at the beginning of March, the UK government suddenly realized that the country didn't have enough uh, ventilators for use in intensive care units and hospitals. So they issued this grand challenge to the manufacturing industry in, in the country, say, look, we need to vastly ramp up our production rate of these machines. And companies from very diverse sectors, aerospace, um, high performance engineering, automotive, logistics, all came together to form a team um, to effectively build, design and build and produce at a scalable quantity uh, new ventilator machines. So they started in March with nothing and within 16 weeks they had produced 11,000 of these machines and they have said that they were only able to do that through two principal, uh, uh, I suppose, interventions. One was the use of digital technologies to support them in what they were doing uh, and secondly um, the, the the need for companies to realize that they had to collaborate, they had to be open in their sharing of data, that uh, the people involved in the team, um, and I think Siemens was involved as one of the, the uh, team members, Michael, mm -hmm. you may be aware better than I of what, what their role was, but um, you know, it, it didn't matter whether you were CEO of a company or a shop floor operative, you had the same influence to uh, make things happen on this project. So- Great. You know what? I think that I'll leave it at that, Roberto. In terms of what levers nations can use, I think it's it is down to the public sector to provide um, the funding support. There are organisations represented here today and others that are members of the GFCC that can then step in and, and help to deliver what's needed. Hey, well, oh. wow, Paul, can I just footstop something that you said, and and you said it so eloquently, but small businesses bring such an important. Um, set of diversity and innovation to our global supply chain that it is incumbent upon us to figure out how to make sure, make sure they succeed. So yes, um, yeah. right there with you. And, and I was very pleased to hear you say <laughs> that um, the, the intervention by such a large company as yours to, to make sure that the cash flows to your SME suppliers in, in a timely manner to sustain them during this difficult time. That, that's very interesting and certainly very welcome, I'm sure, as far as they're concerned. But I would Great also topic. Far bring, bring to say that that you know supply chain enablement and excellence is the fundamental enabler for everything we want to do. Yeah. Fantastic. So I think topics that you mentioned, topics that you mentioned here, diversity in terms of different profiles, not just technologies, but in terms of product lines. And I think that it connects what to what Michael had said, this notion that with digital, maybe you can break some trade-offs that we had in the past and be able to serve different markets and do uh, 
other things. But you, uh, Paul, also mentioned the importance of making decisions and being purposeful on investing in innovation. And so thanks for sharing that. And Gianna, uh, our colleague Gianna from Sagazio, Sagazi from Brazil has just joined. And you are one of the leaders who has been making the case for that worldwide and in Brazil. So thanks for doing that. Um, we just closed our poll here. And I think that just want to briefly share the results with everybody. So we invited people to talk about the main technologies that they, they see reshaping the environment manufacturing. What came first was artificial intelligence where 47% of the answers I think it's interesting to notice that before the pandemic, the market for AI was growing 55% a year around the globe. I bet that, the, that, let's say, that has gained momentum with the pandemic. So first AI, second IoT, then robotics and 3D printing. But roughly 50% of the people here joining us from across the globe see AI as the main technology. Uh, driving the changes that we're talking about. So, um, and having said that, I want to turn to you, uh, Paulo. You have been seeing changes in the manufacturing environment over the years and over nations. You led Embraer operations in the United States. You are now the global VP for manufacturing working with your company, but ensure as part of your production system, engaging with a variety of companies and SMEs. So what are the, the drivers and the enablers that you are seeing for us to build this new uh, manufacturing future? Over to you, Paolo. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Roberto. And uh, 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 thank you for, for inviting me for this this uh, discussion here. I'm very honored to, to be part of this, this panel. Uh, I'd like to, to, to start by pointing uh, manufacturing is the driver for innovation. Uh, countries that decided to abandon manufacturing, they, they give up on, on keep uh, innovating, uh, trying to, 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 to short circuit uh, design to low cost countries and uh, imagine that uh, manufacturing would be just the, the dirty part of the, 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 the chain uh, uh, led us to, to lead, lead them to some uh, some wrong decisions in my, my point of view and and to link uh, to to what Deborah said I totally agree that uh, 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 manufacturing drives uh, and this uh, and keeps the, the, the innovation alive uh, said that uh, we have been, been been in this digital journey at Embraer for a long time and starts exactly by, by trying to connect uh, operations in different countries and uh, not just operations, but uh, the, the engineering, uh, uh, the, the, the design uh, of a company inside different houses in different uh, countries as well. And uh, we start uh, 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 also by, by trying to, to shorten the, 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 the cycle time in between the initial concept of a new product through the, the, the total deployment in an, an market uh, uh, by trying to, to move as much as possible uh, of our effort uh, through the digital world and trying to connect uh, uh, these different uh, things and to reuse information from one environment to another environment and uh, simulate as much as possible. So uh, uh, typically uh, uh, when you are in an industry like ours, the, the, the aircraft industry, uh, to, to achieve a, what I would say a stable uh, manufacturing maturity, take, take some time, uh, some hundreds of uh, uh, products uh, to stabilize the process and so on. And uh, uh, 100 cars at uh, manuf uh, uh, car manufacturing means uh, some hours of manufacturing. 100 cars for aircraft manufacturing means in some cases, more than a year or two years uh, to get there. Uh, so it's uh, very, very important to uh, try to anticipate this maturity by, by bringing things uh, from the real world through the digital world, because digital is, you can uh, do mistakes there and you can uh, uh, quickly fail there and, uh, and uh, fix uh, things there. 
is cheap, cheaper than than doing it a real world, and uh, and uh, and uh, we start uh, 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 moving. Uh, machines, uh, buildings, uh, uh, product itself uh, through this digital world and connecting the, 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 the world that uh, was an island at the beginning, the, 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 the CAD world uh, where we design the product through the, 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 the shop floor uh, uh, manufacturing uh, execution systems to reuse this information and uh, preferably doing that uh, uh, using 3D information as much as possible uh, uh, to try to, to have the same level of knowledge, no matter if you are in Brazil or in US or in Europe or in Mexico, whatever, but, uh, uh, but uh, being intuit intuitive uh, to our uh, blue collar guys as much as possible and delivering them uh, 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 very good information uh, validated in digital world and in, in, in um, the most intuitive way to, for doing that. And uh, also uh, uh, to connecting that to the, 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 the final part of the, the product life cycle to, to, to Michael's point, uh, I truly believe that's uh, about to, to see uh, from end to end, from the, the beginning, the very initial phases of development through the, 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 the phase out of a product, everything uh, 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 and connecting this. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, since uh, 2012, uh, we abandoned uh, every paper at our shop floor and we have all digital information at our shop floor. And uh, what was amazing because sometimes uh, when we deliver an aircraft, at uh, the past we used to deliver also a truck full of paper, manuals and so on, <laughs> to support the aircraft being delivered. And uh, after some time, we, we, we digitalized to, to, to see this and so on. But uh, amazing today is, is that uh, we, we run in parallel. And uh, when we finish manufacturing of an aircraft, the audio doc documents and the, 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 the checks and balances and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, paperwork needed uh, for, for the, the authorities, the, 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 the certification authorities is ready at the same time as the aircraft. So it's, it's a a huge gain for us and uh, and uh, a little bit on, on the, 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 the cooperation as well. Uh, we have a, 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 what we call integrated uh, product development uh, process. So we, we, we put together people from different uh, disciplines related to, 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 to the aircraft, for instance, uh, power plant guys with avionics guys, stress analysis guys and so on, all together to, to develop a product. And, uh, and uh, some years ago, we invested uh, on uh, some uh, immersion 3D environments, enabling us to put at the same session uh, people from different countries uh, to do, for instance, a design review for a product. So we have been, been using these different aspects of digital manufacturing to, to enable us to shorten our cycle time and also to be more, more precise on what we deliver to our shop floor and after to, to our customers as well. So trying to summarize that that's the, the, the journey we have been doing at our digital manufacturing at Embraer. Back this is to super you. exciting. This is super exciting, Paulo. I, one of the things that I did in one of my past lives, I, I was in the manufacturing space. So it's amazing to hear that from you. So thanks for sharing. But I would leave one question for you for the, the following round is, how do you prepare people working across nations, across cultures, across uh, levels in the hierarchy? How was that journey of preparing people? Yeah, and when I when I say preparing people, I take the opportunity to uh, transition to Pelayo Covarrubias. Pelayo, you you are not in the manufacturing space; you are in the national space, trying to to push a whole country to become more digitalized. How you see those things that we talked about here and digitalization in general and what are you doing in Chile? And it's amazing to have Chile uh, represented here and to have you with us, Palayo. Over to you. Well, thanks Roberto, a lot to GFCC for the invitation. Thanks for all the panels. I guess we have a great conversation. Uh, thank you, Deborah, too. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, very, very interesting about where you're talking about. Let, let me begin with some <laughs> worldwide comment. We are in the middle, in the middle of the COVID lab. 
let's go to science. The world this year is having this COVID lab that is changing everything. In six months, it's happened more than a decade in digital transformation. So if we really want to have a talking and a good conversation about what will happen in the next five, 10 or 20 years, we have to understand what happened this year in how we accelerate the digital transformations due to the COVID. And if we will have another coronavirus in the next five, 10 or 20 years, because the world is changing so fast because this lab, this COVID lab, that's difficult to answer your question, Robert. That's for first. Second, if we talk about this COVID lab, let me give you four samples of how our life is changing. First, our family life. Most of the people, I don't know you, but in Chile, are living with their kids in their houses. They're having home schools. They're having to teach their own kid in the house. So that has changed a lot, all of the manufacturing uh, 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 changes because we're now teach our teach our kids in our old home school how to work. They are leasing us how we work. That never happened before in the, in the life. So if we see the next five or 10 years, I can assure you that the, all the manufacturing that we used to uh, how to, to, to work, this will change because our kids that will get out to the, the universities, think about this year, all of our university school as, uh, are in, their, in our house studying, sharing with us, with like our parents, our feeling, our teaching. So it's, this is the first point that I want to, to, to tackle. How is the family changed? Second, how we are changing. We are working, I don't know, 12, 14 hours a day, 15 hours a day, we wake up in the morning, we stay in a room and we work all the day without transitions. We don't, we don't, we, we know now we don't go up to a bar after the, after we work. So now that is changing our personal life. I don't know how many of you are making a sport among this year or how it changed your life, this COVID love. So, I guess we have to talk these issues before talk manufacturing because this is changing the way that we work, the way that we live the world. Third, how it's changing the place where we work. If I, 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 I am chairman of a foundation in where we push all of the digital transformation in the last 20 years in Chile. We have the 25 big, big worldwide companies, digital companies. All of these companies, they're locking down their offices and they're telling us that they will mix the office in like in a co-work and then we will have the another part of the office in their homes. How we will change the services that, they, that, that we use in the world due to these changes in how in the place of work. And finally, and, and I guess the most important thing is the entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship mind. How has changed the way of think the new product? How has changed the new way of use the, 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 the new product that we are uh, every day taking, the e-commerce? In the United States, at the end of uh, 2019, Deborah maybe should know this, 19% was e-commerce, 19%. Amazon, their dream was in 2025, get to the 24% of e-commerce. At the end of the second quarter in the United States, they had 43% of e-commerce. That changed everything. That 43% in e-commerce changed everything. So what happened for my, my vision, Roberto, and I am very agree with Michael says from Siemens, Michael talk about education. I only think that the most important thing now is how we change education. And let me show you in a little sample what happened in Chile. For me, for País Digital Foundation, the most important thing is how to reduce the gap, the digital gap. We have, we have more than 80% of the people 
we, we, they, they do have a broadband, but we still have people that don't have broadband. They're separate world. Some people live in Earth, some people live in Mars without broadband. Second issue, what happened about how we use broadband? People, for instance, 40% use a, a internet to educate, to training. 90% use internet to play. So if we are using internet to play or to training, they have a huge difference in the future. If we see our kids now, 90% of them, they're playing PlayStation. So I can teach you that in the next 10 years, the future world is our kids now, how to play in PlayStation, they will be working. Because who is teaching now our kids? The schools or social media? So when I try to put all of these issues that I try to tackle you, my point is we are facing a huge geopolitical change in the world. In between Asia, look, 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 United States these days, <laughs> how they're counting their votes, look about Europe, and we can see how we will uh, put in the future all of this digital, but not digital transformation, cultural transformation. So to end uh, this part, Roberto, I guess when we are talking about preparing people, I have to be agree with Brin and about flexibility, collaboration, new ways of training, good Brin, I totally agree with you, but we have to accelerate that because I guess when we listen the people talking about manufacturing or we listen people about talking in factories, says this COVID lab changed that for always. We will see a new world from this COVID lab. And this is changing a lot in the entrepreneurial mind of our kids that they are getting teach in our school with us learning from us. I really resonate well, I with what you're saying. I, and I would say this is not a technology challenge. Our biggest challenges with all of what we're talking about is about culture change, right? It's about culture exactly. shift. And how do we accelerate that with our, with our heritage cultures um, to, to be successful in the future? So I totally resonate with how you describe that. Technology is all around the world in the last 2,000 years or 7,000 years. <laughs> yep. Great topic to continue our conversation. How to accelerate that change? And saying that, for if you are joining us here, we have another poll that is open that it's really related to that. What are the, the key issues that we need to advance like manufacturing and digital manufacturing or the things that we're talking here? So we have a poll that's open, please join us. And we also have some comments and questions coming. And I think that they were touching up on things that you, Brin and Pelayo just comment here. How can we change, um, how can nations at a larger scale uh, go into this direction. But before we, we, we go around and we get other comments from you all, Deborah, I want to turn to you to, to reflect on this amazing series of insights that we just heard. Thank you, Roberta. Well, I'm happy that we're recording this session because it is so rich with insights and experience. And I know, uh, Michael talked early on about, you know, the, the important metric of productivity at the end of the day, you know, what we are talking about, about productivity enhancements and what that delivers to our standards of living and prosperity. Um, Alex, you talked about, you know, the critical new manufacturing strategy being developed in Australia at the highest level with your prime minister. Again, recognition of the sovereign importance of having manufacturing capability and assets and building the enterprise. You know, uh, something I think that might add to the discussion here, we haven't talked too much about additive manufacturing and of course the digital component of that to be able to send a, a blueprint and have it, you know, immediately in real time being fabricated through, through additive processes. Uh, next time we're better, we should get uh, the CEO of Loco Motors on um, that's bringing that 
uh, digital manufacturing right into countries around the world um, through additive systems and transportation. But um, technology with a purpose, of course, you know, technology exists, tools and capabilities to just enhance our lives, but enable us to do things better. Uh, criticality of the supply chain. I think we all talked about that, Paolo and Bryn, and I, I love the model-based enterprise that was described. Um, as, as really how we're going to need to work in, in the future. Paulo on the great issues around culture and how we're going to educate. I think also, um, you know, this whole issue that, that you brought up, Paul, about how we bring the small and medium-sized enterprises into the ability to work with large-scale uh, corporations at the cutting edge. And, and you know, obviously Embraer, Lockheed Martin, uh, being, and Siemens have to do this in order to, to have the businesses and capabilities and innovation they have. I did want to share, um, because Lockheed Martin was one of the founding partners of, of an initiative that U.S. Council on Competitiveness led some years ago called Endemic, the National Digital Engineering uh, Consortium. And Lockheed Martin, General Electric, uh, Procter & Gamble, and Deere came together with some of our leading universities and government partners to actually design a new way, a new partnership to bring modeling and simulation tools into the supply chain of the Midwest uh, manufacturers. And the, the reports are still there, they're fabulous, we can post those. But what was amazing, there were companies, and, and Michael, you'll appreciate this working for Siemens, there were companies that were on the verge of going bankrupt and having access to these design tools through modeling and simulation. This was supercomputing, they were became within six months exporters to Germany. So that was an incredible metric. And so how we knit the small and medium companies with these large enterprises in the digitization is something that I think is absolutely key to the future and unleashing the uh, innovators as well. Um, I, I am uh, cognizant of the fact that we do live in a physical world and we have to remember that things are also made and produced in environments that cost huge amounts of money. And I, I will signal out, you know, while we see digitization and acceleration of that in the design and production of advanced semiconductors, you know, putting up a fab to produce these uh, systems that enable everything in our digital world costs, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And so that's a challenge also um, as we move forward uh, in ensuring national sovereignty and capabilities in, in, in these fields. And the last thing I want to say is on the digital divide, the digital gap. I think one of the SDGs of the United Nations should be the universal right to electricity and the ability to function in the digital world. And, in the, and I can speak for the United States, we still have a huge digital divide in dense urban areas, in rural areas, children not having access to the equipment they need for remote learning. So um, I'm being a little bold here. We've coined in the US Council and our national commission, net neutrality is obsolete. We need net equality now. And that's something that is also gonna unleash this, this, this great transformation. So I'm gonna say my formal thank yous now to everybody. I know there'll be some more discussion, but we're just thrilled and honored you all joined us for this fabulous discussion. The amazing comments, Deborah, and you just touched upon some of the things that we captured here on our poll, and we, we can, um, let me finish that. So we invited everybody to reflect on, on what are the key issues that we should address to move forward this whole digital reality, right? Um, the options were skills, regulation, business models, and infrastructure. 50% of the participants um, said that skills is the primary thing that we should address. Preparing people, right? Developing the skills, training mindsets. The second thing, infrastructure. I think like Deborah just mentioned this digital gap, this divide that uh, we have around the globe. So having said that, I, I want to turn back to you, uh, Michael, Paulo, Alex, Brain, uh, Paul, uh, what, what's needed? Uh, how can we, what are some of the concrete cases and examples that you are seeing around the globe, that you are working on, uh, that are moving the needle in relation to those things? 
Who would like to go first? I would start Alex. a bit off. I'm, I'm really not surprised seeing that the poll showed that the skills skills aspect is the is seen as the as the key enabler as the key enabler of the transformation. It's 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 you know as Brin also mentioned, uh, and I've always kind of believed in that that this whole transformation is all about people. It's about people and enabling people to be the leaders of transformation. You know, and skills are critical for that. This is one of the reasons we've commenced, you know, a number of pilot programs, and as you've mentioned, turning them into scalable models. I love the the model-based enterprise that Brink has mentioned, you know, developing models, scalable models to 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 build on. So Siemens and 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 my network that I lead have partnered to 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 develop something like that, and that involved, for example, a model where Siemens and its supply chain across Australia selected SMEs, got together. We co-design a, 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 a diploma program in Industry 4.0, which is moving them to associate degree, we, uh, which has embedded training and education in industry, where industry is an active participant. And it's kind of a blurring the boundaries because it's really about co-design and co-delivery of education, which Paleo said, time for new models in education. This was about trialing new models of education and delivering that program to a cohort who actually from the outset were ending up as employees across that supply chain. And they are the agents of change. You know, through that transformation, they've already commenced transforming those companies and, and following the completion of the programs that were really the champions of change in those companies. I think that model is scalable. We've worked on that now across the country in various pilot locations. And we believe that through that workforce development, where we are co-designing with industry and co-delivering with industry, you know, skills programs that are around digital skills, but also not just digital skills. Our, our research shows that it's not just the digital skills that are important for digital transformation. As Paleo mentioned, you know, there are a number of other you know, traditionally called soft skills or cognitive skills or enduring skills around change management, around working in multifaceted, diverse teams, around working across complex ecosystems, around, you know, resilience, a whole lot of skills that are part of that Industry 4.0 transformation that we sometimes take for granted, that that's something you develop through experience. It is actually essential in a new model of education and training. So trialing those elements has shown us that transformation at that SME level happens successfully through people development. Well, one thing I have, uh, yes, please bring. I'm sorry, because I, I am very passionate about this piece. And I think um, to just build on what you were saying, Alex, um, you need to make, we need to make this new reality real to our existing employees but also our future employees. So at Lockheed Martin, we're looking at it from a two-pronged approach, right? So we're looking at how do you pair these new early career professionals with um, senior folks, uh, get with our technicians on the floor, get the energy and the excitement through that learning and transition planning, and then really use those um, new empowered folks as champions, really to grow the excitement around what that future looks like. And then uh, on the future workforce, you know, how do we better partner with universities to shape the curriculums so that those new skills, because when you think about the folks we're we need now and are gonna need more of, they're going to be part mechanic, part IT, part engineer, part data scientist, right? And so how do we part, uh, shape those curriculums to get the, the skills we need at scale? And from a Lockheed Martin perspective, really looking at where we can enable um, underrepresented, uh, um, underrepresented communities where, where we're focusing on STEM programs for girls or for folks of people of color. It's very important for us to, to grow those pipelines. And so those are the things that Lockheed Martin is, is focused on as we look to, to grow, excite, make it real and scale um, that future workforce. Roberto, may I add something to this? I'm so passionate sure. about this and, and hearing what Bryn was explaining as their example and the views about this approach. It's exactly, it's exactly, that's, that is the, at the heart of the transformation, what you've explained. Roberto would know 
exactly for that reason, also in this pilot that, that we've been developing, we've also involved the National Manufacturing Workers Union, exactly because of that engagement of the workforce and the, and the, and the, and the work environments actively in, in transformation now, not just in the future. And having all the stakeholders engaged, and as you say, Brie, you know, enthusing them to be the champions of change. Yeah, and maybe maybe I would love to add something additional to this. It also starts with us learning. I mean, you know, we are all senior leaders in in, in companies and in institutions and things like that. And you know, maybe ten years ago, I would have said my knowledge is good enough, you know, to carry me to the rest of my professional career. But with digitalization, I mean, the innovation cycles are so quick, the technologies are so quick. Every two, three, four years, you have new technologies. I mean, it starts with us and saying, well, we need to continuously learn and, and can't sit on our laurels, so, you know, which we, which we have done over the years. And, and that also helps us to understand the new workforce, as everybody said. Um, I think we need to keep pace. We need to learn too. The whole organization needs to learn. Deborah? I just want to... Sorry, a little bit of context around the cultural um, dimension of how people view manufacturing. I mean, we're all talking about the advanced manufacturing transformation that we know and understand and underway. But for large components of our populations, and one of our, our Council on Competitiveness um, wonderful CEO members, Nick Pinchuk, the CEO of Snap on Tools, says, you know, manufacturing, going into manufacturing is the, the uh, uh, second prize, the third prize when your child doesn't, quote, get into college. And, you know, anecdotes tell stories. I, I recently was with a gentleman who'd been a manager at one of the Target stores and was telling me his son is a skilled electrician at one of our major universities, makes well over $100,000 a year. He said, you know, I had all these college graduates at Target that were, you know, working the cash register with no plan going forward. And Germany's done such a superb job in vocational training. And Brazil as well, I think, through, through Sabri and everything. How do we do a better job of changing the narrative around advanced manufacturing enterprise is one of the most exciting dynamic fields to be in for your future? I pose maybe, that. Yeah, maybe Paolo, if I could tee you up for that. So, okay. and let me jump in on that. <laughs> uh, first, I'd like to connect to 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 bring uh, uh, idea that uh, is the same as myself. I think we must bring more diversity to this this game, and it starts by 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 emphasizing the STEM careers at the the early ages of our kids. Uh, what I feel is, is missing, there's a gap there, because uh, uh, I could see it in the U.S. as well, years I lived in the U.S. Uh, uh, typically, we get uh, engineers, we get uh, uh, data science, uh, uh, STEM career uh, kind of professionals, almost the same uh, profile. Uh, uh, boys, same age, same, uh, let's say, kind of family and so on. And the uh, and the uh, diversity brings uh, brings the, the the richness to to to, to this game, and uh, and uh, to your point of uh, Sebrae and the uh, SESI and the other systems in Brazil, uh, uh, what uh, I can see they are doing here hard is trying to 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 trigger this interest in the, these kids at uh, earliest age possible. And uh, and uh, bring them uh, uh, to the schools and uh, and uh, at Embraer in particular we, we also have a, a school here, even though we manufacture crafts, but we have a, a experience on the education outside as well, and we provide a high school for for very poor kids uh, uh, here around the, around the company, and uh, uh, in Brazil is uh, would say a little bit different uh, from US, uh, uh, the best uh, universities are public. You pay zero. To go through a, a, a very good university course, but in the other side, uh, to get there, unless you, you came from from a wealthy family that is able to pay you a very good uh, elementary school, uh, middle school, and high school, you never get there. And uh, and uh, what uh, we did here was was to to experience something different. So you offered the, the best possible. 
uh, kind of uh, uh, training for the, these kids at uh, at uh, at uh, uh, many high school, and uh, we get a kind of almost ninety percent success rate on, on putting these these poor kids at uh, public university. And uh, and uh, we do that uh, 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 by training them and by offering also uh, uh, the, the opportunity to experience uh, things. So so trying to 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 move from the, the boring classes that uh, you have uh, just a guy speaking uh, something and kids trying to 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 take notes and so on to to offer them more labs, more more space to to have them experience experiencing the, these uh, kind of things. And they're creating their mental models by themselves, and uh, we get success on doing that. And uh, what I could see in this uh, Sebrae and uh, SESI and so on uh, systems, uh, where we are getting success in Brazil is exactly by, by offering more practical classes, more labs, more experimentational uh, uh, room for these kind of kids. That's uh, I'd say my two cents. Thank you, Paulo. That's much more than two. Yeah, and so thanks for sharing that. And you actually comment on something that we, we are doing in the GFCC. You had a chance to, to talk with Alex in the past, but we work with our colleagues at the Industry Confederation in Brazil, the National Industry Confederation. We engage with a variety of players around the globe to see how this whole thing about the skills, it's being driven. And two things were we identified as very important. It started early. There's a growing number of schools initiatives that want to engage kids as early as possible in technology, digital, et cetera. And the other thing is social capital. That I think connects to what Deborah said, but it really is about your initiative, Alex. It's very strong because you have the social capital needed to build all those partnerships. And having said that, Pelayo, if you, if you could comment, you, you are the one who brought to the table this thing about uh, amplifying a, a mindset shift. And you built a foundation to do that uh, throughout your country. So uh, what's key to, to make this change happen at a large scale? Uh, thank you, Roberto. I, I guess we are in the middle of a huge bridge in between the, the 20th centuries and 21st century. And sometimes we are talking differently. We are talking about sometimes a world, a transactional world, in where the services doesn't have much to say. I am thinking about services like Uber, Airbnb, the, 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 the big ones services. And now, and then this, this new world, the 21st century world, which is the knowledge world. I guess it's more important when we talk about manufacturing, we talk about the, how we, the knowledge transfer, how we are doing this knowledge and the transfer of all of this uh, intellectual property in this new world. I guess when, when, when I'm trying to talk about entrepreneurship mind, I am thinking now, that the way that we manufacture in the 20th centuries is will be totally changed after this COVID. The most important thing will be logistic. I agree in that. Logistic is fundamental, more than manufacture. Because in manufacture, we know that we have the, the automatization, we have robotic, we have many things to, to help manufacturing. But in logistic, we have a huge uh, uh, issue again, uh, uh, and this issue show that this pandemic show us the issue of the logistics. So what we are thinking in a digital country here in Chile, how we push our country, our services to this knowledge new world in where we have to teach the people in how to transfer knowledge, know how to transfer manufacturing. We are thinking in each, my father have one job in their life. I, I have like five jobs. My son will have five or seven jobs in a month because it's changing the way that we used to work. So I guess when we are trying to push these kind of things in Chile, is try to teach the teachers in how they have to, to be the flexibility and the, 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 the skill to teach this new world of transfer knowledge. And that, sorry, is a huge cultural change. 
because it's very difficult to understand. Because if you, you are used to work all your life in one factory, now that's end. So how you change that? Roberto, Deborah, Deborah asked a question in terms of how do we change the perception and how do we, how do we change the, the view of manufacturing? And I think uh, Pelayo has actually touched upon that a little bit. We've seen manufacturing in the past as something that you, know, you put in a factory, there's a factory floor, there are machines in the factory and you make, make things on those machines. As, as Pelayo uh, kind of tried to reflect on that, that view is completely changed because manufacturing, modern manufacturing is something completely different. We're talking about cyber physical systems. We're talking about uh, cyber physical systems integrated, integrated across, you know, with inter internet of things platforms that are much more broadly seen, you know, from, from ideation across product life cycle management using digital platforms to supply chain and closing the loops and so on. We also seeing the space industry emerging where satellite obtained data is driving industry for zero in manufacturing because it provides in real time amazing data that optimizes the supply chains and logistics that Pelaya was talking about and that are enabling manufacturing globally via digital means better than ever before. So if we are able to shift the dial and start changing the narrative around manufacturing, that it's IoT, that it's Internet of Things, that are digital platforms, PLMs. We are looking at sophisticated digital platforms that require you know, higher levels of creativity, systems thinking, design thinking, hyper-connectivity to create value. I think we have a different, different value proposition for the younger generations. But I think, as Deborah pointed out quite rightly, we are at the stage of, I think, where we need to develop that different narrative. And we need to provide a different value proposition to new generations in terms of entering manufacturing. And I think all the ingredients are there to do that. Shift the dial. Love to that. Paul, over to you. Yeah, just I'd like to make one comment um, based on what Palau said there a few moments ago about the importance and the growing importance of logistics. Um, the ventilator challenge project that I mentioned earlier uh, in this session really could not have succeeded without the participation of the logistics partner, uh, DHL, who, who in very short notice had to source um, parts, multiple parts from multiple suppliers, bring them to a number of different um, assembly points, and then ship the final product out to uh, the health service users. That was a critical role in that project. And I think you're absolutely right. I would agree that in the future, that'll become even more important um, as, Product design and development for many companies in the future is likely to take into account um, international uh, collaborative supply chains or consortiums or, or teams working together on design and manufacture and the physical shipment and transfer of bits and pieces around the world is actually going to be very um, is crucially important to that. Yeah. So the, the use of digital technologies to underpin logistics as a service, I think, will be critical. Thank you, Paul. Um, as we are approaching the end of our session, actually, we're running out of time here. I want to maybe to go for a final round, concluding round here, uh, Start maybe starting with you, Deborah. And then, uh, but I wanted to tee you up and suggest one thing. In that final comment, if each one of you could share one example or something that you have seen or that you believe that people should look at around the globe as a concrete solution to address some of the, the, this challenge that we're talking about. Uh, Deborah? I'm, I'm going to just go back to something I said at, you know, in the beginning of our session, and again, thank everyone, that a nation that loses its manufacturing infrastructure at whatever stage it is in its development, whether it was 19th century, 20th, mid, and now the future, you also lose your innovation of the next generation because they very inextricably linked. And I can remember back in the 80s when the United States lost the ability to innovate in some of the next generations of flat panel displays, which we had invented because we lost and gave up the manufacturing of them. So innovation and advanced digital 21st century manufacturing are all linked together 
And again, the people that enable all of that have to have this very diverse set of skills and capabilities that our great panel has articulated from being both systemic thinkers and also having the ability for linear execution. So again, uh, thank you all for participating in this GFCC conversation. Downloads, manufacturing, and we need to integrate uh, competencies. Thank, thank you for that, Deborah. Um, so Paul, maybe could I turn to you? Um, yes, just one very quick example, Roberto. Um, it's, it's related, but not directly related to the subject of this discussion, a company that I've been working with for the last few years. Um, it's the largest sawmill on the island of Ireland and one of the most highly um, optimized and automated sawmills in, in Europe. In a new boardroom that they constructed on a large wall, they have um, put the UN Sustainable Development Goals up on this wall. And against each of those goals, they've made a statement as to how they as a company and their people are actually working to help uh, their business and their region um, achieve or do their part to achieve those goals and where technology can help that is mentioned and I think that um, is an excellent example of how to stimulate cultural change within, within a company with a view to addressing the most existential threat that we as a race face which is the climate emergency. Thanks for sharing that Paul and whatever you could share here or send us, we would love to dis disseminate that example in the GFCC uh, network. Michael, maybe you, you could share, I love your brewery example. I wish they could uh, ship overseas, but maybe if you uh, could share another uh, idea solution that they have seen. Now, I wanted to you know, reflect on what Deborah said and Pelayo said, basically, I think digitalization is the, is a savior for, for manufacturing. Um, you know, manufacturing is not as, as in the 20s anymore, dirty and, and, you know, those kind of things. There's so much of, as Alex said, so much of software, so much of electronics. Um, you know, manufacturing places look completely different. And um, Pela, you, you said about, um, you know, playing pay stations and things like that. I mean, you know, there's so much more augmented reality coming into manufacturing. Um, there's so much more of, of these aspects actually from games coming honestly into manufacturing, which make manufacturing more attractive. And we just have to talk about it. Uh, in addition to that, I wanted to maybe finally say, so now people are saying, well, I need to have a college degree to work in manufacturing. No, you don't. Because on the other hand side, technology will be more easy to be used. You don't have to be a C++ programmer in the future to work with software. You know, we are working and many companies are working on graphical design of software. So I think in a nutshell, um, I think it's the best time for manufacturing that has been there for the last probably 50, 60 years with all the changes that we see and what digitalization puts into, it makes it very more, much more attractive than it has been before. Wonderful. So visibility, we need to provide visibility to those opportunities and, and possibilities. Uh, Paulo, over to you. Me, I'm mute here. Uh, I try to 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 bring some uh, some uh, thing I, I catch up uh, some years ago during a visit to some uh, Fraunhofer institutes in Germany, where they develop uh, new technologies, but they are very linked to, to the industry as well. And uh, it uh, wake me up that uh, everybody but uh, uh, Germans were uh, concerned about Chinese competition and so on. And they were not because they were looking years ahead of uh, everybody and, uh, and uh, looking everything about uh, uh, Industry 4.0 and how to connect and to be flexible and uh, to bring the digitalization to the, the shop floor and the and, uh, and they reorganize uh, quickly in a very competitive way uh, the shop floor. And, uh, and uh, I bring that uh, with myself and uh, trying to see what else uh, uh, we could do in order to, to apply this kind of things. And uh, what I could see what uh, you mentioned Senai here in Brazil uh, was doing, I think is, is very similar way. They, they, they put some uh, excellent centers in, in some parts of Brazil. And the dream is a very similar uh, thing to, to connect the industry, real problems to the, 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 the research, but also the education outside of this and the, and the uh, working these three pillars, the educational pillar, the, 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 the problem solving pillar uh, uh, as a research center. 
and the, 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 the company in need of this, this kind of help, connecting all these dots to, to provide a, a more comprehensive solution, not just on developing a new technology or solution, but also providing skilled people to keep going that. So that's a, a, thing, a thing I would like to share with you. Right, this idea of mixing different worlds, stakeholders and exactly. training with actually and, implementation. And bridging the, these, these, these uh, things that uh, typically, at least here in Brazil, industry was one thing, the educational side was other industry and the, 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 the technology developer was uh, other as well to, to bridge, bridging these gaps and, and uh, bringing together all these, these different dimensions, okay? Great. As, as I said in the beginning, we were lucky and happy to take a group of our GFCC Universal Research Leadership Forum for a workshop at Embraer last year. So thanks for that. We had directors for U.S. national labs, university leaders from across the globe. We would love to do it again and work with you and your colleagues. So thanks for that. Hope to do it soon. Uh, just after COVID, uh, please feel yourself invited. <laughs> That's fantastic, Paulo. Thank you. Uh, Pelayo, you, you, you shared a very creative idea here. What could we do or what are some of the examples that we could leverage to drive the reality that you are, meant, you are talking about? <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, I, I want to end with two things in, in, in a way to, to explain a little bit more this uh, one job in 70 years, seven jobs in 70 and seven jobs for a month. Uh, I guess one is the, the importance of the modernized governments or the state. I guess it's very, very important what the, uh, we talk a little bit about the importance that they're having and more in the future, I guess, the states. Uh, for instance, in Chile, we have like 40% of the procedures, uh, the public procedures, they are digital. But we are working to get in the 2021 that the 100% of all of the procedures that you have to uh, make like a citizens be digital. That is very important in a way to have a modern and flexibility state who help you in a way to to, to have this entrepreneurship new ecosystem in uh, in the two uh, in the 21 century when we're talking about knowledge if you have a state that doesn't have institutions who allows you or enhance you in a way to be flexibility in your job it's impossible that is one point that I guess is very very important and the second point and I guess I guess uh, Alex and Brin, tackle this very, very deeply, is about human capital. I guess we have to change the way where, how, how we teach our uh, kids, I guess, in, 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 in for the future. Today, we already have the, the, the knowledge in the internet, it's all there. So it's how we use all of that knowledge that we all know. For the first time in the history of the human being, we have all 8.5 billion people connected. So now we are having this meeting. That is amazing, this meeting. Uh, and, and, and we didn't realize this 50 years ago. But this COVID lab give all the world this possibility. Now we have 50 people listening to us. Yesterday, I have a meeting with 6,000 people listening to me. <laughs> so you say, hey, what I am talking about, that 6,000 people are willing to listen to you. It's because now it's allowed to do that and to have this transfer knowledge transfer more easily. That is Robert, I guess uh, I have a, we have a huge opportunity to help to the, our people and please, and this is for all, all of the people who are listening to us, in this new 21th century, we have to, to be very careful with this digital bridge or digital gap uh, people who is out of this gap is out of the world. So that people will be very, very poor, more poor than will be in the 20th century. So I guess this is very important too. Thank you a lot for the invitation. It was a real pleasure to have a meeting with all of you. Thank you. To be continued, knowledge is not a gap. How could we 
not, how can we work together to better use the resources that we have? How could we do that, Alex? Uh, I'm enjoying this panel so much. I just hope it lasts longer than, than, than what we planned. Uh, I might just give a couple of examples. I think we haven't mentioned this, and, and I think it's important to mention at the end of this discussion that to address the skills uh, needs rather than gap skill needs, we, and because there will be a gap and a need continuously, we are not going to have a fifth or a sixth industrial revolution. We're going to have this ongoing transformation. It's a dynamic change. We moved into a completely different era. So lifelong learning is at the center, at the heart of us addressing, addressing the skill needs. And, and that has to be enabled, that has to be supported. Two examples that I've seen that are really addressing that lifelong learning need and capacity are from Switzerland and from, from Singapore, you know, where government has provided a, a, a voucher, skills voucher, a lifelong skills voucher, or a digital passport for every citizen to engage and access training in digital domains to address their needs on ongoing basis. And that provides access to all. It, it aims to address the digital divide, but also it makes it accessible, affordable, easier and scalable. I think that that's something I'm passionate about and I'll be talking to our government about that, the digital passport, the, the, the skills voucher, because I think that's the way, you know, as Pelayo actually quite rightly said, is that's where we move from a sector to a society transformation. And I think that's what we all want to see. Thank you, Alex. And I know that we will be continuing this whole conversation in the GFCC with you. Thank you for your leadership uh, in the things that we're doing. Bryn, your, your final thoughts. Thank you. Um, this has been fun too. So I, I, I appreciate the time um, to, to spend uh, with all of you today. I think I'll end with a call to action actually, um, if I could, and, and that would be to have us all embrace and break down the barrier or perception that you can't have a robust internship program during the type of, uh, you know, virtual work that we're experiencing now. And when, when I think of what Lockheed Martin did over the last several months, you know, we really doubled down and we focused on vibrant virtual internships uh, relationships with trade schools in a way that we hadn't thought of before, scholarships with those trade schools, apprenticeships, so very different models of how to engage the future workforce um, north of, you know, 2,500 um, students this last summer alone, and we vie to hire every one of them <laughs> when they come through their program. So um, don't buy into virtual stuff and internships are hard, um, but really, you know, work with us to make the most robust experiences we can for those, uh, those interns and those co-ops. It's, it's time for action. Thank you for yeah. sharing that, Breen. Uh, Deborah, any final comments? Just for us to finalize. Uh, yes, I guess manufacturing, smart, safe, sustainable searching. Thank you all. It was wonderful. And <laughs> I <laughs> hope we will get to be in person sometime, but but I agree, you know, always in something that's uh, dark and challenging, there's light and, and opportunities, and we're seeing that here. So, and thank you, Roberto, for your leadership. I, I hope everybody will tune in on November 17th and 18th for the 2020 Global Innovation Summit of the GFCC, crossing the chasm in healthcare and advanced technology. Uh, we're thrilled that uh, the Australian Ministry of Health, Minister Greg Hunt will be one of our keynote speakers with uh, interviewed by the chairman of the US Council, Mahmoud Khan, uh, our GFCC chairman, Chad Holliday, the chairman of Royal Dutch Shell will be with us and fabulous speakers from Australia, but very importantly, GFCC members around the world. So we have two days um, and I know the time is structured. So our Australian colleagues like Alex will not be up at the crack of dawn or we on our side will not be up all night long. But uh, Roberto, is there anything you wanna add on the, on the summit? I know we want people to register. Um, we've got a great turnout already, but we're gonna talk about many of these things. Uh, and, and, and the innovation theme that's gonna take us to the future economy. Yeah, so as this is really about the digital world, I do have something analog to show to, show to all of you. 
So please, you can go here and register for the 2020 Global Innovation Summit, gis2020.dgfcc.org. Please join us in the virtual and the analog world. And Before then we're going to get a picture. Go, a picture. That's it. Before we go, we're taking a group picture here. So please look at the camera and smile. This is a GFCC tradition. It was great to have you here. We are having the summit once again, gis2020.dgfcc.org. Please go there, register now, November 17th and the 18th. But also next week in partnership with one of the universities in our University and Research Leadership Forum, the University of Southampton, we're having a conversation in which we want to decode the now in education. Join us on the 12th. And this was a great conversation. I take two, I have two takeaways. Shift the dial and the time is now for us to take action. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.